I used to always go to the concerts, 18, just sitting there, screaming at the test guy. Test one, two, <laughs> yeah! Test one, yeah! You're coming out, man! <laughs> I used to be in like ACDC and all that stuff. I used to love ACDC. Loud, that's like the headbanger stuff. You ever been to headbangers? You know why it's called a headbanger concert? Because the music's loud. <laughs> Lights go out, they come on. Like, ah, 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 ah. Oh my god, my ears! <laughs> I'm on the highway to hell! I'm coming with you! <laughs> my guest tonight is the drummer and co founder of the uh, monstrous popular band Metallica. Over the, yeah, over the past 16 years, they have won three Grammys, sold more than 50 million albums. They just released their seventh album, Reload. Take a look at the band playing Memory Remains. <laughs> anyway, how you doing, this, buddy? This set is not going to spin around, is it? No, no. Uh, Did you yeah. have trouble with that whole thing? Oh, you were spinning oh, and all that man. with the video? We were on that thing for like uh, for two days straight. Were you really? And this whole thing is just, I mean, for 16 hours a day, we were just going around in circles. And I mean, it just, it gave us, um, we had these little wristbands on that would prevent us from like throwing up all over ourselves. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful. Did you know you're getting into that or are they just... Uh, no, we got a great idea for a video. Come down, you know, it'll be, it's a great director. He's done all this before. Sure. And we just go down there and, you know, the next... You're like, yeah, yeah, yeah right. What's this thing doing? <laughs> don't worry about it, Lars. Just get on. Just get don't up there and play it. Shut up. Yeah. Oh, man. Here we go. <laughs> So now you got the uh, album Reload, debuted at number one. Number one. Number one. <laughs> All right. Now originally uh, I heard that, because uh, first Load came out, and wasn't that supposed to be a double album? How come that didn't become a double album? Well, we, um, we wrote 27 songs for what was going to be a double album, right. and we went into the studio to um, you know, record all these, and about six months into this process we're like, this is kind of getting a little boring. Maybe we should uh, break this into two records. Right. That way we also get, uh, if you put a double album out, it only counts for one album on your record contract. If you put two out, it counts for two. <laughs> so that's so right, we figured we'd get one back at the up. record company. Sure. <laughs> so we, um, we put the first 14 songs out on load last summer, and then we went out on the road for about a year, and right. then we came back in the studio this summer sure. and put out the, um, and finished the other 13 songs and put them out a couple of weeks ago. As some people saying, oh, is this the uh, leftovers? But it's not the leftovers at all from load. This no, I mean, like we, we had 27 stuff, yeah. songs, and yeah. I divided them into two even records. Uh, most of the songs that ended up on Load were the songs that were, were done first lyrically. James, right. we write all the music, and we get it all together. And then James sits down and writes all the lyrics literally like 15 minutes before he's going to sing them in the studio. <laughs> so <laughs> it's like a really good thing. So Here's what we're doing. Right? So you come in there, you're like, oh, I wonder what this song is going to sound like. He's still scribbling as he's singing, you know. <laughs> I need a second verse. Yeah. But so all those songs that end up on Load were the ones that were the earliest done, and then the other 13 ended up on Reload. Now, how would you say the rest of the uh, rock world would view Metallica? Would he, do, they, do they come at you hard? Those they guys come still at you around? <laughs> God, the persistence <laughs> of these guys. Um, you know what? There aren't a lot of bands um, who've been around for 16 years. No. And there aren't a lot of bands, especially in, in our world, who've been around for 16 years. Most of them are sitting somewhere in a gutter with a needle up the, in their arm or something like that. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry. sorry that no, they know. No, they know. It's, it's true. No, no, no. It's true because okay. the 80s, you had <laughs> all these uh, metal bands and they're like, right. check out my hair. Wow. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, all, you know, yeah. all our peers that, that we came up with in the 80s, I, 
our third MIA. You know? I, and you're absolutely <laughs> right. I remember but you guys. You're the guys that plowed right through. Right, and like, but you know, we see um, where you guys are in ten years. We just kept it, kept it going. Yeah, um, sure. The, the chemistry of what we have in the band and the combination of the people and stuff like that are, you know, we don't have people that have severe like problems in terms right. of dealing with being in a band. Exactly. We're all tolerant of each other. None of us have severe drug problems or alcohol problems. And no or egotistical. No, I mean, you know, apart from, and all that. from Cliff exactly. who died in the accident in yes. 1986, we've had an unchanged lineup for yeah. uh, for 15 years. Right. Which now, is what a it, rarity? <laughs> I, as a as a stand up, and I'm sure as a band. What what do you think uh, is the people when you're putting out the new album? Does it matter what the people is it relevant what the people are thinking or what they expect? Or it's more um, it's increasingly. It, I mean now it, it's completely irrelevant. I mean when you are on your way up, of right. course you. I mean we've always been very stuck in 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 our own space and very confident and standoffish about what we do. You know we do this for ourselves. Right. We do this in a way that. I think from a creative purity point of view, you have to look inward because sure. the minute you start listening to what people want from you, then, then you it become becomes, that becomes a product. Yes. You know, then I might as well be selling toothpaste or something. You know? <laughs> so <laughs> exactly. so it's like we have always had a very standard office situation with the media and, 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 and with our fans and so on. Not in a negative way, but just it's best for the for the creative elements. Sure, and, absolutely. But you know, we had an album in nineteen ninety one that came out, as you know, called The Black Album. The Black and, Album. Monstrous. And after that album, yeah, so, big fans. Oh, Black somebody album. bought it. Oh, a lot of people bought it. You know? um, a lot of so, people bought so that. So that that record basically sold like 20 million copies worldwide. And, and you after, guys were first. Yeah, I remember people going, "Oh, you know, they're going for the pop." And it wasn't that at all. I thought it was an amazing. No, I mean, but that was still when you know when we were sort of like climbing. Do you know what I mean? Yes. There was still another yes. level of success to get at. Nowadays, the best thing I can say is that we survived. Mm -hmm. that experience. We survived having a record that big. We survived the two years on the road. Right. And now we are so content. We do whatever we want. We're doing it for ourselves. <laughs> We're feeling. floating floating around in the little Metallica bubble and people are throwing darts at us. Oh, you guys cut your hair. You're so loud. You <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's like, doesn't phase me. Exactly. I'm still alive. <laughs> and that's all that counts. We'll be uh, back with Lars Ulrich when we return here and later. Jim Brewer, we're chatting with Lars Ulrich. That was a while ago, man. That was a long time ago. We were hippies back then. <laughs> Goddamn hippies. I'm still a hippie. <laughs> inside. I'm a hippie on the inside. <laughs> now, recently, you did a free concert in Philadelphia. What spawned that whole idea? Uh, Garth Brooks. <laughs> no, Garth Brooks. No. Garth Brooks played a free concert up in Central Park about three months ago, three, four months ago. Sure. Ago. Like, that's a really cool idea. That'd be a good promotional tool for you know the new album and um, so we wanted to play up in Chicago because we have a lot of friends up there a lot of fans up there right and we're like uh, hi we'd like to play a free concert here in Chicago they were like uh, and we don't, we don't think so stay away Metallica and uh, so we tried Detroit and we tried Cleveland and blah 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 and finally there was no place that would accept us within their city limits because it was so frightening as you can tell oh, and good. so we, <laughs> we, we, we did a contest with um, basically you know with radio stations find a, a place where we can play it and right. Philadelphia came up and um, so the promoter there I guess hadn't cleared it with the uh, with the Philadelphia City Council oh, so no. about three or four days before the um, before the gig all of a sudden the council members up there they put an injunction against big bad scary Metallica to keep Metallica out of, of Philadelphia and we took him to court and we won Thank you. Good for you. And, <laughs> and you rocked on that day. And we, we played, 
We played a free concert in Philadelphia for 50,000 people, and everybody lived to talk about it. There was no, there was nothing there was no that cross burnings, there was no whatsoever. satanic rituals. Exactly. Marilyn Manson wasn't there. It was a no, beautiful thing. No heads bitten no, off or anything like that. Beautiful. It was a good time. Yeah. People had a good time. <laughs> now, was drums your first instrument? Was um, that thing you instantly yeah, went for? Yeah, pretty much it's the only instrument. You know, when I, was a, when I was a kid and sitting there at home in Copenhagen, Denmark, where I grew up and, and we were playing along, you know, all of my friends were playing air guitar, doing this. I and, did all that. You yeah, know how many you know, concerts I, just, I gave I was my sitting there basement. doing this. <laughs> sure. So I was air drumming along and... Um, <laughs> I used to do yeah. air guitar. <laughs> Come right, on, let me see. Go. Ah, and ah, I got to do the crowd. Ah, <laughs> ah. Oh, dude, don't you remember? You put on the headphones and... Yeah! And your mother catch you. Ah, mom, come on, man. <laughs> What we, used to do, what we used to do, I used to get some of my friends together, we'd get into this like tiny little room, and what we'd do, we'd blast the heat up in the room, <laughs> so and we'd get, yeah, and we'd get like a couple tennis rackets and like a broom shaft and a couple like paint steerers for drumsticks, and then we'd sit in there and put on Deep Purple's Made in Japan, and we'd pretend we were up <laughs> on stage, and it was like about like 90 degrees in this room, right, and we were just like sweating, and we're up on stage. One I day I want to do this for real. I was there with you. I was there <laughs> so, with you. Now, who were your idols? You just mentioned Deep um, Purple? Or? I mean, I started getting into it when I was really young. I was, like, going to concerts when I was 10. 10 years yeah, old? 10 years old. In, in 1973, my dad took me to see Deep Purple in Copenhagen. And I was, like, this tall. I'm, like, running around. And there's Richie Blackmore out there throwing his guitar around. I'm, like, wow, this is really cool. That's insane. I, um, you know, at that time, it was Deep Purple, Black Sabbath in the mid-'70s also. Um, you know, growing up in Europe, there were bands like Slade and Sweet and yep. sort of like European yep. sort of pop sure. music and sure. so on. And then it started getting into the more European like metal stuff like Judas Priest. Judas and, Priest, Iron and Maiden. Maiden. Yeah, no, that was a little Ryan later, but Dio and all that. But stuff. initially, yeah. it was Deep Purple. That was that was it. And that was the thing. Uh, stick around. We'll be right back with Lars Ulrich when later returns. Lars Ulrich right here. How'd the band form a long time well, ago? Um, <laughs> <laughs> God. You just came out of the tennis? Wow, you was, finished the, the air prison. guitar concert? Um, I know, I was kind of out there too. Uh, well, I was born in 1963. No, um, I, was, I was living here in LA. Uh, the whole tennis thing had pretty much uh, fallen flat on its face. Yeah, bang, and that's out. That was over. Uh, failed tennis prodigy there. And uh, so I decided, I decided basically, okay, now I want to I wanna play drums and I want to be in a band because that's what my second love has always been. So I took an ad out, as you guys will probably know here in L.A., called The Recycler. Go into 7-Eleven, get The Recycler. To you recycle. know, Section 802, you know, musician seeking bands. And, yeah. you know, drummer from, you know, heavy metal drummer looking for other people into forming heavy metal band. And uh, so I'd put like these wacky bands in there, like all these overseas bands nobody yeah. had ever heard of, you know, like Diamond Head and Angel sure. Witch and Tigers of Pantang. And people would call it, well, I'm really into heavy metal, but I've never heard of Angel Witch, but I like sticks a lot. Does that count? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, <laughs> I got to go. <laughs> and so anyway, I hooked up with this guy, James Hetfield, who finally answered one of the ads. And um, me and him just, there was a vibe there. And yeah. um, we sat around and listened a lot to all my my English records, and I played him a lot of stuff that I was into, and you know, you want to try and get this off the ground, and yeah. um, we formed a band, started writing some songs, played around LA for a little while. We went on the road and made records the year after we formed. I mean, I was only 19, which was really young <laughs> for, and we were traveling and making records, and that was back in 83, um, and, and 16 years later, Jim, Jim's we're got his own out. TV show, and I'm his guest. <laughs> <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> now, speaking of that, <laughs> Wait, you're not Cindy Crawford. You're cheap. <laughs> I guess I'm a week late. <laughs> now, within that, um, 
You achieved a lot of milestones. I mean, a lot of milestones, I would say, professionally, probably uh, not professionally. Is there anything that you haven't hit that Lars Ulrich still would love to do? Um, jump out of an airplane? <laughs> Go, uh, yeah, really? Well, I don't, I don't know. know. I mean, you know, you have these lists in your head of all the things you want to do. One day I want to go trekking in the Himalayas, you know, one day, you know. Um, I'd say one day I would like to, um, I think, penetrate the movie world. Um, really? You know, all, all guys in rock bands want to be movie stars. All and guys vice versa. versa. But, you know, I... Because uh, right now, you I know, mean, I'm dying. But movie, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's up, New York City? <laughs> Trust me, you're all like that. But movies have been um, a love of mine for like 10, 15, 20 years. It is mine now. It's my great escape away from music. I love pictures. I love the art of filmmaking. I'm really interested in the writing. I'm interested in the direction. I, I go see as many movies. It's my great escape away from music. And I think one day it would be fun to penetrate that world, mainly because I don't know very much about it. And so, you know, like, now, either act or do maybe some writing or sure. some producing or whatever. Now I would say, even though you don't know, you say you don't know much about it, but still, aren't but, you involved with the videos? I mean, don't you? Yeah, but, you know, videos. Even though you're I mean, active, but still, right. no, that's, uh, yeah. I would say there's a lot going on there. I mean, I think I I'm, I'm, would be more interested in the creative aspects of movie making. Right, I sure. think that um, I am what most people refer to as a control freak <laughs> surprise. And, um, and I think that it would be very difficult for me to be in a medium where I would not be able to deal with all the creative aspects right. of it, which is why I think I would probably feel more comfortable being involved in like the writing or the direction Directing or the pr and pr producing, producing and all that, like that stuff. But, sure. I mean, making videos is just like, I mean, it's the most overrated thing. And you know, just, you show up, we did a video the other day, you show up, you sort of, you have a call time at 10, you know, you sit around for six, eight hours. You, <laughs> I know the you feeling. Go, you, it's like, it's the most boring thing. I, and then you go up and you sit and mime along to a song you recorded two years ago that you can't remember <laughs> the parts for. And then that's it. And then, you know, they do it all in post-production anyway. And then that's it. But. One day, I'd, I'll penetrate the movie world in one form Sounds or another. Sounds good, man. We'll work together. Yeah. I'm Jim Brew. We'll be right back with Lars Ulrich here later. <laughs> Welcome back to Later. We're here with Lars Ulrich. Lars Ulrich, who uh, you also have a big interest with art. With correct? art? Yeah. What Aren't you a big art guy? <laughs> big art guy. You're a That's big me. art guy, <laughs> Lars. <laughs> uh, yes, Jim, I have a, uh, a great interest in art. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, like what kind of art? Um, you want to get really specific oh, here? I love to be really specific. <laughs> well, in 1948... I'm Sidney Crawford. I'm still out. a week late. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I'm really interested in um, abstract expressionism. Um, abstract expressionism is basically like Jackson Pollock, William de Kooning, Franz Klein started getting into Motherwell and, and all these guys that started basically after the war when art worldwide you know, had always been, the focus had been in Paris and the focus kind of shifted to New York and there was all these young guys coming up that were doing all these like really new things, not the impressionist had always been, you know, here's a nice picture of a church or here's right. a river right. and these guys started getting into all these things abstract that were just sort of that could be interpreted in so many different ways and I love things that aren't real sort of matter of fact that you can look at these paintings and get different things out of them you come back to them the next day and you see something completely different and I collect some of this stuff and it's great going to auctions and sitting there and sweating and doing all these type of things and bidding along it's, it's a lot of it's my great passion also really? part going to movies. auctions yeah, yeah. Good. yeah. <laughs> uh, Oh, no, it's just scratching my head. <laughs> and that Picasso for 53 million goes to the young man down in the front. <laughs> hey, that's our show for tonight. I'm Jim Brewer, and I'll catch you later. Thank you, Lars. Right. Yeah.